subject that I have wanted to talk about for a pretty long time and thankfully you guys give me many reminders and request it as a topic and that's my five favorite blooming shrubs. Now right now front and center in the back garden is this absolutely fabulous Wygella. Now this is a category of shrubs that's kind of old fashioned, but now is experiencing, I think, a real resurgence in popularity. And if for no other reason than there are so many wonderful new varieties and cultivars out right now, there are some with variegated foliage, with gold foliage, with dark foliage. There are compact forms. There's different color uh, colorations of it in terms of its tubular flowers. But I absolutely love this one. And anecdotally, I think this is one of those shrubs in my landscape that I would say every year performs really well. But this year, I think it benefited from this extremely cold winter. Because look at the profusion of blooms. It's absolutely spectacular. And I love the way these kind of dark cerise pink blooms look against this um, this gold foliage. Now, last year, you may remember, I think I did a video on it, about how I pruned it up from the bottom. And I'll see if I can locate that video and put a link to it. Because one thing that I consider to be a signature touch in my garden is that I love to take what could be a common form shrub or just a standard form bushy shape and really beautifully prune it into something spectacular. And last year I did that with this one. And Stuart, if you, if you kind of can look below. You can see where all sorts of new suckers have come up, but you can also see where I exposed the trunks of the main plant itself. And I will do that again this year because it has assumed this just wonderfully beautiful, and you'll notice there's still some kind of dead wood in here I'm cleaning out, but umbral form. Stuart, if you can back up just a little bit so that you can kind of see the outline of the plant itself. Now, one of the reasons I love doing this is because it gives me room underneath to grow things. So just a matter of weeks ago underneath here were all sorts of Spanish bluebells and daffodils. It looks to me like there's some iris coming up underneath there. But I also like to really prune it up because it gives room for these gorgeous cascading branches to kind of just pendulously come out in a waterfall fashion from the center of the plant. So it's really, really beautiful. It happens to be the colors that I've got growing in my garden right now at this time of year. So that would be my number one favorite flowering shrub as a category, Wygella. And I will also put some links to some Southern Living varieties that are really great that I hope to be able to try one day. Okay, so now let's move on to number two. Well, apparently I can't talk about my number two favorite flowering shrub. And these aren't necessarily in order because I love all five probably equally. But that would be this fabulous Chinese snowball viburnum. Now I've told you ad nauseum that I planted this probably about eight years ago from a, I think it was a two gallon shrub, maybe even a gallon shrub from Lowe's. And it was $11. I had no idea what the mature height would be. Every year, it just kept growing more. And when it got to a certain size in stature, I did my favorite thing where I pruned it up from the base to expose the beautiful architecture of the branches. And I like that because it, it lends importance, I think, to something that wouldn't be so spectacular otherwise, because then you have this great tension of the gorgeous foliage and the flowers against the architecture of the trunks of the tree itself, because it does become a small tree. Now, you can see right now, I, I intentionally did not go ahead and do my pruning 
so that you can see what it does and what ultimately you have to maintain to keep this form going. Now I only do this maybe once a year or twice a year and that's that I need to prune off all of the foliage and the branches that are growing out from the trunks themselves. And you'll also see at the bottom that there's all sorts of vigorous growth. But again, once I clear this out, it exposes the gorgeous bark and the textures of the tree itself. It also, again, gives me planting room underneath. Now, what's underneath here now is spent, but again, I had Spanish bluebells, I had some Miss Lemon Abelia that has kind of died out. It died out this winter, but it's coming back from the root zone. Overall, it just is definitely the queen of the spring garden. Some years in early spring when it blooms, you can't even see any foliage. It's completely covered in white blooms. This year it was very beautiful, but the blooms were larger but not as plentiful. So again, I think that is in response to some kind of weather event. Nevertheless, right now it creates just a beautiful backdrop for the garden. It is a great focal point when I look out my kitchen window and it continues to be valuable as my number two favorite flowering shrub. Now let's go to number three. Well, I said we were moving on to number three, but I'm gonna call this 2.5 because it's another wonderful viburnum. I'm gonna put up some cards, some screenshot this cards that you guys can take a shot of so you'll have them for future reference for characteristics about these different types of blooming shrubs. Now, in general, remember that you prune after bloom. So on all of these varieties that are blooming in spring, I won't prune on them until after they've already bloomed. If I pruned prior to that, I would be cutting off the flowers. Now this one isn't nearly so spectacular in terms of flowering. You can see that it's getting ready to bloom. I've got tight little flower clusters here. But what makes this one spectacular is the foliage. And the name of this one, I believe, is All That Glitter. There were, there were two that I started from a quart size plant from Proven Winners years ago. There was all that glitters and all that glows. And I can't remember exactly which one this is. Nevertheless, it is absolutely beautiful. I love the way the glossy foliage illuminates the garden space. And then ultimately, these flowers, which will turn white, will then produce blue, navy blue berries later in the year. Again, I'm going to be very curious to see how the cold temperatures affected its, um, its performance in terms of flowers and burying. But this would be my 2.5, another viburnum that is staged beautifully in the foreground of my number three, and that would be oak leaf hydrangeas. Well, here I am in my number three category of favorite blooming shrubs. I'm standing in my oak leaf hydrangea forest. I can't tell you how large these things get. I mean, I am five feet four, five feet five. So you can see how in the foreground, how tall they are. And that's not to mention the background where they're even taller. I can't remember when they've had so many abundant blooms. Stuart, if you can show all of them back there that are just glowing in the late afternoon sun, these are gonna be fabulous. Now when these bloom, and I'm not sure, this could be snowflake. I've got actually numerous varieties that are planted in here. I'll try to name some of the more popular ones, but these get huge. And they are, once I planted them here in this great location, they get, oh, sun to, to semi-shade. They just really took off. And I transplanted these from the, the home that I lived in prior to this one. 
and they have just absolutely gone berserk. They've got almost <laughs> like a, a, a primordial quality about them, kind of dinosaurs. They've gotten so huge. The foliage is every bit as captivating as the flowers, some of which will reach this long, I kid you not. I have actually created dried flower chandeliers out of the blooms in late summer and in early fall. So this is absolutely spectacular. And, and again, the foliage turns just a beautiful, beautiful bronzy red in the fall. And I take that into account when I am planting companion plantings like the barberries and things. Now, I'm not gonna categorize this as one of my favorite shrubs, partly because it just, I think, can be difficult for some people to grow, though I've had great success with it. And that would be the Dutzia that's usually, um, it's about to come out of bloom. I think there might be a few flowers over there, Stuart, that are, that are still fresh. But the rest of these, just finished blooming in an absolutely gorgeous white. To me, it's a quintessentially English garden uh, plant shrub. It, it's spelled D-E-U-T-Z-I-A, and I will list this one also. I think now there are more compact forms, some that maybe bloom in pink. It reminds me a little bit of Bridal Wreath Spirea, but I really like this better. I've showed it many times. It's part of my spring white montage, but it looks absolutely gorgeous in the foreground of this oak leaf hydrangea, which has this kind of wonderful bone coloration to the stems of the leaves and in the veining. Equally, I think, as gorgeous as the flowers and the plant itself. So the synergy that's created with the Dutzia in the foreground and the white when it's in bloom with this wonderful, wondery, wonderful, whitish, silvery underside of these oak leaf hydrangeas couldn't be more beautiful. Obviously, I will show you these again in the future when they are in their full glory and I'll probably be cutting massive bouquets to bring into the house. Now let's move on to the next one. Well, I just can't resist. This would be 3.5. It's another oak leaf hydrangea that absolutely I have fallen in love with. Now this is a southern living plant. It's hydrangea terra. It's an oak leaf hydrangea. You can tell from its really distinctive leaves, but it has one of the most perfect hydrangea blossoms I've ever seen. Now, Stuart, if you can do a real close up on the bloom itself, look how tightly packed those individual buds of this flower are. It's unbelievable. In fact, I still have from three years ago, I've got one dried hydrangea bloom from a terra hydrangea that is still absolutely perfect and so compact. It's, it's, they almost don't look real. So I got another one that I'm going to put in here in this same location because uh, some of the things over this winter didn't make it, but obviously this did and it's thriving. Now, a number of you have told me that you've been on the lookout for these and you've had a hard time finding them. I'm gonna try to do a little bit of research with Southern Living to see where they can be found. Um, I'll do some research for online, plants by mail, other places like that because you are going to want to get one of these in your garden to put on your list. If you can't find it now, look for it later. It's a Terra oak leaf hydrangea. That's my, my bonus, 3.5. Now let me move on to number four. Well now, surely you say, surely she is going to mention those queens of the garden, roses. Well, truth be told, I have a mixed relationship with roses in general and some in particular. Now, I like you, I mean, what would a garden be without at least one rose? And I have grown many over the years, but sadly, a number of them succumbed to rose rosette disease, even those that were supposedly resistant. And it's just in their DNA, I think, that all roses, regardless of their disease tolerance, are gonna have some issues 
problems with black spot and spider mite and other kinds of things. And let's face it, if they're really thorny, they are just not necessarily one of the more fun things to have to tend, prune, and maintain. That said, I couldn't imagine a garden without at least one David Austin rose, my absolute favorite of all the categories of roses for their fragrance, for their, um, their, their growth form, for the shape of their flowers, for their old fashioned qualities, for their delicious colors. I've grown many over the years and I, I if you were going to try a rose, if you have not heretofore grown a rose, absolutely you need to try a David Austin rose. Just like everybody in their life should have a, own a convertible at one point in time, everybody in their life should grow a David Austin rose. Now there's other varieties that have much to, um, to commend them. Some of the drift roses, this is one of them. Um, I have shown you in the past, Stuart, if you can very slowly turn around, you can see this was basically, um, it, it came off of a Lady Diana rose, another drift rose that was planted here. The mother rose succumbed to rose rosette and this just came up. It somehow had layered itself and propagated itself in the ground. But in general, if you have to have a rose, then just do some research first. I would definitely look towards the heirloom roses, towards David Austin roses, and maybe some of the varieties that tend to be very specific in their application, like ground cover roses or drift roses. Now, let's end up at number five. Well, never let it be said that as a gardener, I cannot learn, evolve, and change my mind. I can remember at one time when I really was not a fan of Encore Azaleas. That was very, very early on in their development when they'd just been introduced to the market. And that was my own failing because I just, I tend to be kind of a purist. And I thought, oh, I don't want Azaleas that, that that don't bloom in their own time. I didn't care that, I didn't want them to repeat bloom in the fall. Um, I just, I, I was just a purist. I liked the old fashioned azaleas and I still do. But now I have reframed how I look at them and I am so captivated by all of their assets that I've completely overcome my initial resistance because Encore Azaleas they just are a wonderful plant. Now, sadly, I don't have any to show you in bloom right now because we had such a hard winter. I've told you ad nauseum, we got down to record lows, minus 13. But here in the garden, I had some, some encores that hadn't even been in the ground very long, and I'll be darned if they didn't survive. Look at this. They have put out all sorts of new growth. Now I say prune after bloom, but these, they had a lot of, of dead wood because there was so much winter kill. So I went ahead and cut these back. These should bloom with a good feed. I'll give them some holly tone and they should bloom beautifully this fall, especially now because I have more light here. Now, one of the biggest mistakes you can make with Encore Azaleas is that we don't give them enough light to really bloom heavily. But if you are looking for something, a flowering shrub in almost any color palette, in any range, in any hue of pink or red or white, or a mixture of pink and white, or this gorgeous one. This one is called Autumn Bell in a beautiful corally color. Then I promise you there's an Encore Azalea for you. Just look. Once they get established, they are tough as nails. I do think they need a little bit of maintenance to keep really a beautiful form. Some of them can get kind of lanky when untended, but that doesn't keep them from blooming. They, like I say, they're the, the most favorite reblooming azalea on the market. They will rebloom in October. So when I started looking at them as just a whole different category of blooming shrub and quit looking at them as kind of a classic azalea, it completely transformed the way I think about them. And if you're someone that doesn't want to put out just flat after flat of annuals for seasonal color in the spring and fall, look to Encore Azaleas, which are really, for me this year, get an A plus 
for toughness, durability, and their capacity to withstand extreme temperatures. So I'll try to put some of my favorite varieties up. They're easy to find just about everywhere. And that completes my list of my five favorite blooming shrubs in my garden. Now, do I have others that I don't have room to grow? Yes, but that will be for another day. A gardener is always thinking about the future. Thank you.